breaking up is not enough. Flourishing in the Human Space, a podcast by Polly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger. When you peek into the cosmic unity of existence and feel the love and inspiration of awakening, what happens next? Whether it's through meditation, spiritual practice, near-death experience, ingesting a mind-altering substance, or being born again, you don't get a map for improving your messy life. In this podcast, Holly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger draw on expertise in science, psychology, adult development, psychedelics, NDEs, dreams, and Buddhist practice in conversations about compassion, resilience, responsibility, kindness, and development after awakening. You will learn how to chart a new path for flourishing in the human space in which waking up is important, but not enough, and growing up is never finished. Co-hosts Polly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger bring different kinds of expertise. Polly is an author, psychologist, Jungian analyst, longtime Zen practitioner, couple therapist, and founder of Dialogue Therapy and Real Dialogue. Michael Berger is an entrepreneur, an expert in psychedelics, a spiritual practitioner of Jewishness, a skeptic, a Real Dialogue specialist, and a filmmaker who is known for his documentary, Improbable Collapse, The Demolition of Our Republic. Polly and Mike will engage with each other and invite a wide array of guests who are accomplished scientists and seekers whose work lies beyond the hegemony of materialism. Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor is a Harvard-trained and published neuroscientist. In 1996, she experienced a severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of her brain, causing her to lose the ability to walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of her life. In her memoir, My Stroke of Insight, she documents her experience of stroke and her eight-year recovery. This memoir spent 63 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction. Dr. Bolte Taylor is a dynamic teacher and speaker who focuses on how we can all activate the power of our own neuroplasticity to not only recover from neurological traumas, but also to choose a life that is more flexible, resilient, and satisfying. In 2008, Jill gave the first TED Talk that ever went viral on the internet, which now has well over 27.5 million views. Also in 2008, she was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Her recent book on healthy brain functioning is called Whole Brain Living. Interviewed by Polly in an earlier podcast about this book, Jill has since then reached thousands of people, guiding them to understand neuroscience in a way that helps us increase insight, confidence, and ease in our everyday lives. In this podcast, Polly and Mike have a fascinating and frank conversation with Jill Bolte-Taylor about awakening and about brain function, as well as about the role of psychedelics in today's world. Jill raises serious concerns and questions about the potential for brain injury and even schizophrenia in young adult users of psychedelics. She and Mike speak openly about the challenges and benefits of the widespread encouragement of using psychedelics for mental health cures in an era in which many U.S. states are debating the safety of making psychedelics widely available. In many ways, this conversation exemplifies the use of real dialogue as all three participants speak for themselves, listen mindfully to each other, and remain curious without necessarily agreeing on any or all points in this expansive exchange about awakening the brain and social and psychological challenges and benefits of psychedelics. There is no other conversation online 
that is quite like this one in its range, depth, and healthy disagreement about the use of psychedelics. Jill, it's wonderful to see you again and to be here with you and Mike together. You know, when you and I talked last time, we talked about whole brain living when it had just come out and the four characters that are kind of Jungian archetypes. And I know the book has done extremely well and helped lots of people work with a sense of the brain in a very contemporary, but also very wise way. So, you know, Mike and I wanted to talk to you especially about the topic that we have been talking with a number of people about and with each other, which is the issue of awakening. And so I'm going to define the way I look at awakening, and then I'll ask Mike to talk about his view. Uh, and I want to say in advance that I have no particular expertise in any kind of psychedelics. That's one reason why I have my good friend Mike here with me. My expertise in regard to awakening is primarily Zen Buddhism, which I've been practicing now for Oh my gosh, I hate to say it, but over 50 years. <laughs> so it's a lot, a lot of practicing, a lot of reading, a lot of studying, a lot of traveling around the world. So my understanding of awakening is, is fundamentally breaking through what one could call an ordinary sense of self. It's, it's a kind of sense that I'm here inside of my body and the world is out there. And we're in a kind of dualistic relationship of self to object. You know, I'm in here, world out there, it's split. Then that way of experiencing things allows us to treat the world in a way that's not self, you know, that is not like me. And from a Zen Buddhism point of view, that is the deepest ignorance that humans have. And we have it for good reasons, because when we develop as infants between about 18 and 24 months we develop this sense of self in here and world out there now there are many things that go with that but one is the sense of embodiment another one is use of personal pronouns another one is the ability to pretend to abstract ourselves and so on so all of these developmental aspects, all humans go through if they function in what's called like a normal way. So they can walk around and plan things and feel the you know future and the past and so on. So a, a deep waking up is breaking out of that and sensing the immediate and direct contact with, oh, you could call it original love, universal love, the undivided world, or you know, I think you could call it one of your characters, a sort of you know, explosion into, I guess, right hemisphere and, and a kind of a sense of being all at once and all together. However, no person can dwell in that. No human can dwell in it. So the, the human has to come back to that sense of ordinary self. And then over time, you can visit back and forth with these experiences. And over time, also, what happens is that as this awakening let's say, deepens or becomes more a part of you, uh, there's a deeper recognition of ethics, integrity, transparency, all of these aspects that we would call, let's say, moral precepts become kind of ordinary. You, you sort of see why they function in favor of yourself, <laughs> you know, that you're not giving up something to be generous. You're not, you're not doing something weird to be compassionate. In other words, these are real, realistic ways of being. For me, that's that's what waking up is. It can happen suddenly or it can happen gradually uh, for people who are practicing deeper meditative practices. And there are lots, lots more things to say about it, but that's that's pretty much it. So, uh, and, and it does bear resemblance to near-death experiences. Reading about Bruce Grayson's work in, you know, research on near-death experiences. Not all people, of course, who have death experiences have all of these properties, but Many of them at least touch into that sense of breaking through the self and world division. And many of them also touch into the sense of universal love. So I noticed after I read Bruce's book and we talked to him how much resemblance there is for some people that have had near-death experience. And then Mike is going to talk about psychedelics, which is another 
let's say, road into or path into awakening? So from my experience of, from psychedelic work, the awakening experience entails an expanded state of awareness. Subject and object appear to merge. Uh, boundaries, my ego boundaries, my sense of self dissolves. It includes, or it can possibly include a shift in values, meaning, purpose, generally dramatic shift in worldview and sense of self, which becomes more expansive. And once that experience of dissolution and union dissolves and I return to myself, that sense of self has shifted in where, at least in my experience, where the center is and meaning or significance is one of the, to me, one of the big takeaways from the experience. And then the challenge is how do I bring that into my everyday life? And as Polly pointed out, we can't stay in that state. We can't function in this world in that state. So Jill, if you would just tell us what is coming up for you as we're as we're speaking about this, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're having some thoughts from your work and your perspective. So maybe we can have sort of some sort of foundation um, or platform for talking about awakening, and then we can launch into all of our questions about whole brain living and awakening. So thank you for both of you for that, because you're both in my language, as I perceive the brain, heading towards working the same circuitry inside the brain, which is the right hemisphere. And with Buddhism, with meditation, with prayer, with mantra, how do we occupy that left hemisphere so that those cells can settle down and we can then open ourselves to literally the present moment and the experience of the present moment. And in the present moment of the right hemisphere, Mike, as you express, in 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 what happens with a psych psychedelic journey is that you ever is that the boundaries disappear and we blend into the collective whole and i love polly that you brought up development because essentially we are wired as two right hemispheres at the time of birth and then during that one, two, three years, the left hemisphere begins to separate its, its job from being a part of the collective whole. So if I'm born into this world as a fetus, as a new infant, that is really just a right hemisphere energy ball connected to all that is. And we know, I don't even know the boundaries of, you know, where I begin and where I end. And through my flailing movements, I eventually realize, oh, I have some control over this thing. And then and that becomes a part of the development of my building the construct of me, the individual. So the left hemisphere actually is the construct of me, the individual. And in order to be a functional, effective human being in the world, I need to be separate from that whole, or as you express, we can't live there because we're completely non-functional. We have to have this identity. And isn't it beautiful that we have these two hemispheres, one where we are connected to all that is, and that's what we stem from in the development from that single cell to all the cells that we are by the time we're born. And then post birth is when the circuits in the thinking parts of our brain really start to interconnect. And part of that thinking in the left hemisphere is a group of cells that is my ego center, it defines me and where I begin and where I end. Uh, I have to have those cells in order to perceive those boundaries. Um, so normal development across time, I am a part of it all. And then I become the individual. And because of the way our value structure is set as our society, the societal norm says me, the individual needs to climb hierarchical ladders. I need to be smarter. I need to be, I need to be more attractive in this way. I need to have a bigger house. I want more and more and more and more, which is what that left hemisphere is excellent at providing. And it has to relate me to the external world, which it does with language and our ability to communicate, among other things. So that's the normal trajectory. And then through the use of meditation and other tools, we can actually quiet that circuitry so that we can go back to the, the experience of being at one with all that is. And, and that shifts our perspective when we really recognize that, that I have the value of the we of us as a community, of us as humanity, in relationship with this beautiful planet and all the universe and all the energetic 
holes that make it so that we can even exist at all. So, so to me, you're both describing the experience of movement from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere experience, but the left hemisphere becomes so dominant that it, those cells actually are inhibiting the cells in our right hemisphere that allow us this experience that you described more of, Mike, as, as you shift into the boundaries dissolve, you feel connected to all, you feel this expansive there's an openness and there's actually an awareness that I am that, but then as that goes away, I'm shifting back into the circuitry that is very well developed because of your life span and what you run. And the thing about cells is the more we practice, as you know, with Buddhism, of course, the more we practice something, the more we do something, the stronger those circuits become. And then the easier it becomes for us to find and access whatever it is that experience is. You're doing the same thing. You're just doing it in very different ways. But every experience we have is based on the brain cells that allow us to have that experience. And so it's like, how do we quiet the left hemisphere? Do we do it with a training program over 50 years of experience that allows us to touch that part and then bring that, that back and allow that to shift our center? Or do we take an external substance and whack ourselves out of our normal reality into a different set of cells inside of our brain with different circuitry? And then we have a very powerful, potent experience, and then we can come back and it's like, okay, how do I take what that was and integrate it into what this normal is in a way that is healthy? So that's a great summary, I think, of looking at the brain in relation to the issues of awakening. One question that I have before we go into psychedelics specifically is that in the early research that was done on Zen meditators, where the electrodes were just put on the brain, and then later research with the Tibetans, and then also Bruce Grayson's work in near-death experience, uh, one thing that's noted across many conditions is that the cortex goes offline altogether. And so in a way, it gets a little confusing to talk about the right hemisphere cortex, the left hemisphere, the front, the frontal cortex, the temporal cortex, when in the deepest states of this type of awakening, and, and again, there are levels, and you know, it's this is really just, let's say, in a very profound way, whether it's through the near death or through the absorption states in meditation it seems that the cortex is offline. It's gone. It's a, they're flatlining people. Sometimes the heart has stopped beating. So there's there's nothing happening from a cortical point of view. And since my late husband had early onset Alzheimer's, I went through his death experience with him and I knew that he had no cortex. I had seen a brain study two weeks before. It was really just the brain stem left that was left for him. Uh, he he went through the entirety of Alzheimer's so that the entire cortex had died. He became conscious in dying. He became lucid. He was, he was interactive and smiling and laughing, understood everything that was going on, you know, the chanting that we were doing, what I said to him. It was really remarkable. He had been comatose and suddenly he came completely aware, completely alive. So for me, when I saw that, I, I did not know about the research that's called terminal clarity and then later found out from Grayson. So there's a little bit of confusion about the brain. You know, is, is, the, is it necessary or, or does it go offline and there's something else like a field of consciousness that's, you know, entered into by a being whose heart has stopped or who has no cortex or whatever. So I would love to hear your comment on that before we go forward. Well, uh, first of all, you know, so many people have tried to put me into the near death experience population and I don't go there. I don't go there because I, that's just not how I frame my personal experience. And although I felt myself to be separated from this body, this form as an individual, I, I didn't die. And in the absence of that experience, I just can't have an opinion about it. All I can really have is an opinion about what I did experience. But I'll tell you this, I have seen, I worked for, for five or six years at the uh, Bloomington Proton Center for people who were had uh, brain trauma. And I would see things in their MRIs and I would always ask the nurses, 
well, what is this person like? Can they do this, that, the other? And it every day I would leave that job and call my mom and I would just simply weep because I would see how lucky I was that I had these brain cells that were able to call back online and function again. And yet I would still hear these stories about these beautiful people who, and I have seen their brain scans, but they were still capable of so much in the absence of these cells or in the presence of these enormous tumors. So there is so much we don't understand. And, you know, just the subject of, of awakening, you know, it, it is so vast. It is as vast as this brain has cells capable of, of altering, being shifted in the way that of which cells are being impacted under what circumstances. And, and I'm sure that an awakened experience by a psychedelic experience versus the awakening by someone who has practiced Buddhism for 50 years versus the awakening by a, a monk who has done nothing and shaped their whole life around the awakening experience are all very different at the level of the cells. And, and, and we, we do, there's so much we don't understand about the consciousness of the energy as the best as I can bridge a gap of understanding between when the left hemisphere is dominating the right hemisphere, what do those cells do? And when those cells go offline and they release their inhibition over what is going on in the right hemisphere, what are those cells doing? And then when you bring that back and you bring that left hemisphere back online and rebuild that circuitry, some of it is going to now go back to dominating the right hemisphere experience where we can't be functional human beings. And yet so we're, we now have new circuits in our right hemisphere that are stronger because now we've had that experience. And so we can revisit that and have that influence our overall shifting the center, whichever of you said that, I'd love that shifting that center. So we'll, we'll stick to the idea here that we'll be talking about the brain and not talking about the brain going offline. And so I'm interested to hear, I know Mike has some questions from what you had said previously about the effects of psychedelics on the brain. And, and Mike studied that quite a lot and has had a lot of conversations. So let's jump in then. I, Jill, I believe that you had raised some concerns considering the psychedelic re renaissance that's now taking place above ground yeah. uh, about the potential for psychedelics to cause brain injury. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, what are your concerns? And yeah. can you talk about what are the possible long-term neurological implications? Yeah, absolutely. Um, through the eyes of a neuroscientist, I don't see this as a renaissance. I see this as an invasion. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. And I don't think it's a good idea for, if you just go and look at the research and you look at the researchers and you look at the, the inclusion, what you have to have be your experience in order to be included in a research project, and you look at the exclusions, it's a long list of everything that you should not, of all the, the reasons why you should not be included in a research project. And if you don't qualify under the variables of a research project, do you think it's a good idea to engage in those molecules and go on that journey in a society where we are just at the beginning, where there's really little to no regulation? And why do I care about regulation? Because right now in what you consider a renaissance and I consider an invasion is we have some people who are, yes, finding some benefit. But when you look at the percentage of people in the research projects who are actually finding benefit, again, we've excluded all these people who would not, right? And then even of the people, the few people who fit those criteria, can we help them under very rigid circumstances? Yes, well, one would hope so, right? One would hope so, that that would be a natural finding. But my concern is for all those other people who should not be anywhere near these molecules. And this is why. When you say to me in your introduction that you can take a psychedelic and it moves you into a melting of my boundaries, well, that's circuitry, all right? You are shutting down your normal circuitry and your normal perception of reality. That's fine, that's what the molecule does, right? And so as we dissolve there, your brain has been very fortunate to be able to get off of that molecule and remodulate itself to turning that circuitry off. Not all brains can do that. 
And if you go back and you look at the research in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, literally a third of the cases of people diagnosed with schizophrenia were impacted. They, they gained that diagnosis because they had taken a molecule, mostly psilocybin, and opened up their hallucinating circuitry, and then the brain didn't get the memo to turn itself off. I have a problem with this. This concerns me. It concerns me personally because that's exactly what happened to my brother. So I have a very personal relationship with someone who was in that condition. And my relationship to him and his diagnosis with schizophrenia has shaped all of my education and all of my learning. So that's one thing. The other thing is that the brain's natural response to trauma, whether it's a TBI, whether it's a stroke, whether it's whatever, an internal trauma, the brain's natural response to trauma is neuroplasticity and neurogenesis which is the exact response that the brain results in after the use of psychedelics. So the psychedelic experience itself is to the brain resulting in its, tra its response to trauma, which says to me, there are cells in there that are not very happy about this. And what I care about as a neuroanatomist is I care about the health and the well-being of the cells inside of the brain. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> Wow. Wow. <laughs> I care I mean, passionately no, about this. No, you're passionate. No, that's great because yeah. my, Mike and I love passionate people. I <laughs> I I do think that your approach is unique among the people that I've spoken with. And I think that it bears, you know, listening to. I'm not, I mean, personally, I I, I don't have the experiences, but here's the thing that I find interesting. And I'd like to hear Mike say more about this. So let's look at Zen training, mm -hmm. for example. And so when I began the training, and also when I've been to Japan, I would say it is titrated trauma. Because um, what happens is, you know, you're, you're awakened very early in the morning, like 3.30 in the morning. Uh, you get very little sleep. You don't get much to eat. And in the in certain branches, like Rinzai training, you also get hit with a paddle to wake you up, you know, it, but it, it's scary. A part of what is going on in the training itself is cre it's creating an environment that's going to overwhelm your ego, but it's going to overwhelm the ego in so-called safety. But, you know, I know personally people that have died in Zen retreats, young monks, young teenage guys who were dehydrated as well as exhausted. So the the idea there, you know, let's say traditionally the Buddha really didn't do any of these extreme things. It wasn't until China and Japan got involved in the practices and recognized that you could, let's say, speed it along, kind of like with psychedelics, you could kind of speed up awakening if you created an environment to defeat the ego rather than just wait for the ego to collapse eventually, which is more of the way the Buddha taught, you know, except again, it's hard to say because the Buddha had been dead for 454 years before a single word was actually written down about what he said. So it was an oral tradition. So who knows exactly what he did say, but in general, the Buddha seemed to sponsor the idea that people needed to be healthy, that they should avoid the extremes, that they should stay in this kind of middle way. Way. But when you get into Zen training, it's almost like they've forgotten the middle way. I mean, you, you're going to the extremes. But where I find there's a similarity here is this idea of creating an environment to defeat what we call the ego, you know. And then in the Zen environment, a part of what is happening all along is you're learning these moral precepts. So you're you're told when you come in in order to take the training that you're going to take, that you you have to practice these moral precepts because as you move along this continuum, your ordinary morality is going to fall away. You know, and that's in part because when you lose this sense of ego, there is a way that it could seem like anything goes. You know, like, well, hey, if if we're all connected here and everything's just arising and passing away, you know, why can't I just do what I want? But in again, on that Zen path, you're you're learning that there are constraints and that those constraints are built into the operation here in space-time or samsara, as it's called, because there is something going on here that you don't immediately understand. And, and we could call it love or we could call it interdependence or we could call it 
radical interdependence. There, there's no really good word for this all at once, all together kind of thing. But where where it seems that there are similarities between, say, near death experience, psychedelics, and Zen training is this creating trauma. You know, and I really didn't think about psychedelics that way, but you're articulating it. It's a it's a kind of supposedly you know safe trauma, so that a person can go through something and have this sense of ego collapse. Now, in our ordinary lives, we go through trauma. And some of that trauma can be used for awakening. I mean, this is the reason why people come to psychotherapy. They they have some sort of terrible thing that happened. And now they're they're more awake. They're more open in a way, even if they're in grief or they're in pain. And now there's a possibility of moving into a new way of seeing things. So anyway, I just think this is an interesting idea you've introduced. And now I'd like to pass the baton here to Mike about the idea of trauma and also the risk that Jill is pointing out. You know, there's a risk in Zen training, but it's a very different kind of risk because you get a lot of testing before you go in, you know, and also there are a lot of, let's say, guardrails typically. I mean, not always, but typically. So uh, with psychedelics, maybe not so many guardrails. So, Well, and I think that comes down to set and setting and preparation. So, you know, one of my concerns is that there are people who are promoting psychedelics as a cure-all for everything. And there are always going to be irresponsible people who use any substance or tool. There are irresponsible people who get in a car and drive drunk, for example. But when it comes to psychedelics, because of its illegality for so long and because of so much of the propaganda that the government put out for the last 50, 60 years, there is an additional trauma, I believe, a collective societal trauma that in using psychedelics, unless you are very intentional and take the experience very seriously, like Paula, you said, safe trauma. And I think having the experience within a container, within a community, for one, having support, having proper preparation expectations. And we know that the key ingredient to this experience is set and setting, knowing what to expect. I don't believe it is for everyone. I was not aware of the number I heard you say, Jill, something like 30%. 30%. Now, is this from the 60s or 70s? Because I've not seen studies that showed numbers that high. Oh, that was that when I was in school in the 80s, those were the, okay. the, the standard numbers taught. And let me say, Mike, that was before modern day drugs. I mean, marijuana of today is not the marijuana of, you know, the 70s and the 80s and the 60s. Yeah, I agree with you. You're right. The marijuana of today has no relationship to the marijuana of 20 right. or 30 years ago. And when it comes to psychedelics, I can understand the concern you've expressed, especially with something like a 5-MeO-DMT, which is this instantaneous rocket ship to oneness and people come back, think they've got to proselytize. Everybody has to have this experience. And what I see in that, the danger of that is it's inexpensive in circles. It is widely available. And yet I've, I've witnessed a real lack of preparation and understanding of people who are almost pressured into having this awakening experience and are quite are unprepared. I would just state that back in the 80s, when you had all this propaganda telling you you're melting your brain, you know, that is not the best set to be taking a psychedelic. When it's illegal, there's a great deal of fear. So I would assume that imposes a great deal of fear and additional trauma that when it's understood better how it works, when it's not illegal, when you're taking this in a controlled setting with a therapist. I mean, that's now how the studies are all done in some cases with dual therapists. I, I would imagine those numbers are significantly lower because I've not seen anything like that in the recent literature. I, I hear what you're saying. There are many, many people who have been excluded from studies, mainly because I believe the motivation is to use this as a medicine in controlled circumstances for people who don't have a predisposition to schizophrenia. And I know that the research is now moving to actually use these medicines to actually help many of the people that were excluded. The first aim was to demonstrate their efficacy and safety, which, again, depending on the substance, psilocybin and MDMA and ketamine, which are now 
I would say, widely used. You don't really hear as many of the horror stories as you did 50 years ago. I think partly because people are more educated, there is less fear. But any time you experience this dramatic transformation of self, if you're unprepared for that experience, it's, mm -hmm. I think, potentially quite dangerous. And if you don't have support, it's it it can it can create lasting damage. Yeah. So I agree with everything that you said, but this is where I take it a step further, is that I have been approached by people throughout the world. For some reason, I seem to be, you know, the trip everyone wants to go on. And I understand that. But, you know, the difference between what I what happened to me and what what these these drugs do is I had an eight year experience of being connected to all that is. So I got I had to I had eight years to figure out how do I integrate that information, because that's a wonder, right? And when you're connected to all that is, it's a wonder. It's also completely incapacitating, right? So I had to purposely, over that eight years, rebuild the circuitry of my ego so I could become a functional person again who could speak language, who could read language, who could relearn all the academic terminology, even though in the right hemisphere, I had the images and the, the pictures and the relationships and the 3D of it all, but I had to have the language. So I had eight years to integrate that so that I could be a whole brain. I could be that, and I could be this, and I could be either in an instant. And and I am either. You cannot be an individual and be a collective whole simultaneously, but you can be both. It's an and, not an or, if that makes any sense. So, so having had the experience I've had, I value completely, I understand completely what everybody wants, right? There's, there's no question in my heart or mind that that stroke experience, even though I lost my life, my individuality, my position at Harvard, my research, all that, even though that's what it cost me to go on the journey I went on, I recognize the value. I have several concerns about what you said. The first one was, so I have been approached by people all around the world about, you know, they want me to be the flag waving, you know, Jill Bolte Taylor, come have the same experience she had with stroke and, you know, be, have awakening or enlightenment or however it gets packaged. And I'm going, no, I'm not that girl, right? I'm, I'm not that girl. Let me help you get there naturally let me help you find understand where you're going so if you take a psychedelic and you land in la la land and boom you're there and boom you're connected to all that is and boom you know the energy the intensity the the love the wonder the maybe even hallucinations and supernatural beings you know how does somebody have that experience and come back to normal reality and find what they really why did you do that? You know, what was the goal and what do you bring back and how do you sustain whatever it might have been that you gained? For what reason did you do it? I agree that there is information to be had. I have to uh, giggle a little about the word propaganda. Propaganda wasn't all propaganda. I mean, there was a reason why these medications, these drugs were dangerous. It wasn't all propaganda. It was, this was tra causing trauma to the brain. It was releasing a, I mean, this was, you know, part of the wave of the 60s. I came in, I was born in 59, so I missed the 60s, but I was of the children of the 60s where the adult world said, we were going to terrify you of any experience that the, the 60s had on your previous generation, and so we're going to show you horrible things, right? So we got all those movies where people were hallucinating and having these problems. But the fact of the matter is that it does result in the traumatic response of the brain and it brings us into this culture which was of the 60s of love and in that culture of love I, I had to giggle at what you said Polly because first of all I love the idea of titrated trauma you know but isn't that what life is it's titrated trauma but it's it's it was pretty much you have to put constraints on because it's love the one you're with and that is so what happened in the 60s which resulted in a whole population that became whatever it became and then throw in some war and throw throw in some say no to drugs and, and all of that. But it wasn't all pop propaganda. So you can't you can't package the, the reality of the danger of these molecules in the human brain into none of it matters propaganda. Okay. That's not fair, I don't think. Now it's what did they pile everything on top of it? Yeah, they did, but they they did that for a reason. 
what and and that reason has cost the psychedelic machine which is what it is a machine now uh 70 years up until you know what we're doing now but what we're doing now and under your circumstances i get that i get the value of going into a setting having a professional who knows what's going on to guide me first of all work with me first of all what is my goal why am i doing this and to help me along my piece. But that's like 1% of what we're getting, what we're what is exploding in the world right now. I mean, I live in Indiana and Kentucky. We grow psilocybin mushrooms for anybody who doesn't know. Just come hunt our woods. You'll find that stuff, right? You know, the machine comes in and says, oh, well, these are safe and they're not good for recreation. I can name 50 people off the top of my head who have used this stuff recreationally because yes. we live there, right? I mean, it's like, so don't lie to me. Be transparent with me about the risks, about the hazards, about the dangers, and then take me on a journey. But if you're going to be a professional and you're going to take me on a journey, how can you set me up for success with one experience, not half a dozen? I, and I, I have to say, I agree with what you're saying. I would also, I'd like to, there's so many things because we have such a short time. I just wanted to jump in. You touched on a thread that Polly and I have actually woven through some of this about the distinction between having a stroke happen to me, you did not choose this experience versus a psychedelic experience, which is something that somebody may choose, right, to have. Second, about responsible use, the key, I think, comes after the experience. It's not the experience itself. It's about integrating that experience without a communal shared setting where people work together to integrate on an ongoing basis. You have this experience like you just described, eight years of work to integrate the experience. I do not take these experiences lightly, and I, too, take a great deal of time to integrate an experience. It's not like I have a set number. I want to do this twice a year. It takes me quite a while to try to integrate into my life the revelations and the experiences that I've had. So there's a distinction here between it happening versus choice. Same thing with a near-death experience. It happens to somebody. They generally don't choose it. Whereas practicing Zen, I, I thought of talking about the titrated trauma. Every rite of passage is a traumatic experience. So it's as if we have to induce some type of trauma to break the hold that that left hemisphere rational ego has over the right hemisphere to use your language. I do believe, though, that that breaking of set can be done in a way that is responsible. I agree. Again, it's not for everyone, though. I agree. Well, but we're not there. That's that's my point. You might be there, but you're 1% of what's happening in the world. And right now, there are people who are not qualified at all to be doing this, doing it. There are people who are doing it recreationally on their own way over here. Then you have people who are know nothing, but think it's a great idea. I did it, you do it too. There's people who are being trained who really aren't over here and the researchers are way over here. And th so I'm calling this, you know, and I'm not the only one, the wild west. We're now in the wild west of psychedelic journey. And that's what concerns me. And that's the reason why I'm grateful that you're letting me have this conversation with you just so that there is a higher a, a, a voice of caution that is based on the anatomy of the brain. And and so so let me share with you just this. Whole Please. brain living. I'm, I'm going to go back to whole brain living because whole brain living re helps us recognize, well, if you wipe out, if all you have is one set of cells and they're not inhibited, what do they do? Well, the left thinking is rational thinking. One plus one equals two. There's no emotion. It's just an analytical process. My pain from the past is in my emotion of my left hemisphere. That's where it does. Wipe that out, it's gone. It's a lovely experience. That's the best part of having had my stroke. But it came back on the line and started up again, you know, after the stroke. So, but that's the pain from the past. The right hemisphere emotion is this whole character of curiosity and openness and, and playfulness and, and entrepreneurialism and innovation and all these possibilities. And we're wired for that there. You don't have that in the left hemisphere. And then in the right thinking, this is this connected to all that is oneness with all that is awareness of what I believe is when you're taking a psychedelic, not all of them, because we didn't have that conversation. They're all different, right? But the, the psilocybin will zap you off into that character one connected to all that is. Right hemisphere doesn't have any boundaries anyway. So the people who I have spoken to who have trained in whole brain living, gotten to know their four characters before they had any psychedelic. And they learn how to do a brain huddle, which is essentially recognizing their different characters inside their own brain and having open conversations. 
when they ended up and they didn't do it had anything to do with me they just did it post you know under their in their own lives under their own circumstances they came, wrote to me and they said i i'm on you know i think i'm on my psilocybin and bam i walk into this room and there are my four characters sitting in a circle holding hands and it's like Wow, now that's a trip because then any of the personal conflict, any of the trauma, trauma is nothing other than a, a, a conflict between a this and a that. You know, if we're good with everything, there's no trauma. But if I want this and I have that, I can experience conflict and there's where trauma can form. So when all four characters are sitting in a circle having a conversation and they're really getting to the root of the problem, to me, that's where sustainability comes in. I don't, I don't advocate for people who want to go every year or twice a year or four times a year or have a package of 12 times. It's like, why is it you can't just have the experience, be so informed, pre-informed pre of who you are, have the experience, be guided wherever that goes, whatever that is. I'm not that girl. I'm not you. I'm not having that experience or guiding. And then come back and take it right into the root of your four characters. To me, that's how you land this ship quickly and so, relatively safely. So I want to say why I think that reason is why you can't do that. And I want to use an analogy, and Mike has heard me use this analogy before, but you know, the one of my big awakenings was my first childbirth, which was with a 10 pound baby who's now a, you know, a tall woman. And it was an exhausting, elaborate labor, 14 hours. I did not take any drugs. I was already the Zen student. I wanted to go through the experience and I almost died. And, and there was a lot in it. There was a lot that took me years to process. I did live through it. I did have a healthy child, and so it turned out well. And for a long time, I just didn't give it a lot of thought. It was only when I began to understand what I had experienced and began to integrate it. Now, my second child, um, the doctors got all excited because I'd had this very large baby who was a month post-mature in North Carolina where they really didn't have ultrasound where I was living. And so we really didn't know that that was a month post-mature child who is at risk then for a number of things. So next child, I get induced. And so in a matter of three hours, I go through labor. I, 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 and it was, it, was, it was both painful and confusing and exhausting, and it taught me nothing. It was, it was too accelerated. And the only time in my life that I took LSD, and I have to say, I took it, I was teaching at Bryn Mawr College, and I, I, don't want to, I don't want to say too much about the people that insisted that I take the LSD, but they were the people in the philosophy department where I was, I was just hankering to get into this committee in philosophy that allowed me to meet all these hermeneutical people coming from Europe, et cetera. And they said, well, part of this is you have to take LSD. And I said, well, Actually, I'm a Zen practitioner. Nope, it doesn't matter. We want you to do this. So I did. It was very much like induced labor. It, it was, I was forced through what I would say at that point, I, because I could retain my awareness, I was forced through a psychotic break. And it was a particular kind of psychotic break that I had seen at the hospital where I was working, the hospital of the Institute of Pennsylvania. And I could track. It was a nine-hour experience. I could track what was happening. And people say, well, it's a bad trip. No, probably I have a very strong psychotic core. I thought it was not what I would call a bad trip. I would just never want to do it again. I was very, very happy for my ego to come back on board. I was think, oh, thank you, ego. I will never, ever criticize you again. You're functioning in an important way. But And I also then came to understand some of the patients that I saw. I mean, I didn't actually handle them, but I would see them in the hallways and so on. The psychotic experience was painful. It was physically painful. It wasn't just a mental experience. It was physically, because so I learned something from that. But the analogy I'm making is that for me, the induction of the birth process was nothing like the birth process. And so when you're inducing awakening, you're inducing it very fast. Now, if you have a near-death experience, in a sense, you could say it's natural in the sense you didn't 
ask for it, but you're thrust into something that if it's a car accident, it's super fast. You know, if you're shot by a bullet, it's super fast. If it's if it's something that's more like a cancer that's taking you over, maybe it's more like a natural death experience, so to speak. But my sense is it's this, it's this super fast thing that doesn't allow people to know what's going on. And so it's hard then to retain the meaning or to integrate it into the meaning of the experience. And that is the thing that I have been very apprehensive about in people wanting to use psychedelics in psychotherapy, to 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 a psychedelic so that they can uh, open themselves to their dreams or something. You know, m- my sense is that there's a natural process and maybe it doesn't catch up to what your ego would like because you'd like to be awakened right now, you know, for these reasons or whatever. But the natural process also has within it a kind of wisdom that is guiding you. Now, on the other hand, so I'm going to say the flip side of this. So on one hand, I'm apprehensive about the way the drug drives you into something that would otherwise unfold differently, perhaps, you know, unless, of course, if you're in a certain kind of accident, you also, you know, being shot, I think you 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 will be going, you'll be driving through, you won't go through it naturally, the death experience. But the the flip side of this is we, you know, I've talked several times to Roland Griffiths before he died, a wonderful human being, really, really careful at Johns Hopkins about using psychedelics to help people and to design environments where lots of people could be helped in various ways. I had no doubt that he was doing something that was very compassionate and useful. On the other hand, he himself had not taken many psychedelics. He he didn't even want to say if he had, because he said if he said he had, it would disqualify him with one group. And if he said he hadn't, it would disqualify him with the other group. But he was a meditator. So he had gone through the natural unfolding. And he wanted, I think, to, to provide something where people could be, you know, induced into something that they weren't naturally reaching through this, you know, really very, it's an extreme sport to be uh, a meditator. You know, it takes a lot of physical energy and a lot of determination. I have no doubt that it's it's really for the very few. And I want people to be able to access some of the benefits without having to spend, you know, 40, 50 years doing very, various kinds of extreme retreats, really, that that are titrated trauma. So, you know, I can sort of feel on both sides of it, but I think that that what you're bringing up, and, and I'm so happy that we're having this conversation, is a kind of caution, and that the caution is really important because these states of mind are very complicated, and our ordinary, you know, left hemisphere, whatever we want to call it, analytical, linear, whatever, that's a certain kind of state of mind that we need for conventional life. And um, it's, it allows us to, to relate to other human beings. These other states of mind, they're, they're very important to dip into and to know about, but if you don't know how to make use of them, they can alienate you from other human beings. And I do see in the psychedelic movement, you know, work with enough people here in Vermont who take psychedelics, want to take psychedelics, I see um, also a kind of egotism or alienation or narcissism that I don't like coming out of it. And so, you know, that's another caution about this. This is this is not something that uh, you rush rush through. It's something that has never been handled that way. But then again, there's that issue of who qualifies, like, why are you seeking this? And so, I, you know, you're raising so many good points, but I do think one reason why it's very difficult to integrate from drugs is that you're inducing it and it, it's super fast. You know, it's like going through childbirth super fast is not childbirth. It, it, you don't, you can't consciously pick it up. It's something else. So I'm, I'm curious about either, either of you can come into this. I, I, Mike, I don't know if you have something that you want to respond to. No, I, I want to hear uh, Joel's response. Before I, I go into the quick induction, I think another thing that needs to be a part of the conversation is the financial gain of uh, the organization that is selling a packet. I might come in and, and and the people who have come to me who have learned whole brain living before they did the the had the experience was then they could go back to their people, two out of two of these people, 
Um, and two is not a big end, but it's all I have to work with. And the feedback that I've gotten from people is that they went back to their people and said, I got what I, I got what I came for. I don't need a package of eight. Um, so financially, those who are offering this, it's a good financial advantage to the machine uh, that is now offering. You need to do this at least six times in what, what some amount of time, blah, 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 whatever. So I think that that is, is a, and also a very real factor. I found it interesting, uh, your comment about the impact on the people also who are doing it, many of them, not all, but I have found there to be an interesting lack of healthy boundary from these people who are, are not just in kind of inviting me in to participate, but kind of insisting that I do. And it's like, mm, uh, mm, uh, mm. and I'm looking at everything from a brain perspective, right? And it's like, what, have you done psychedelics so much that now you've shifted into this connected all that is and lost the, the appropriate social norm? Because again, you know, we're impacting not just which cells are we running in the brain, but what the value is. And the right brain doesn't have any healthy boundaries. I mean, it doesn't have any boundaries. How can it have healthy ones, right? And so so I think that, that really taking a look at, at this whole thing, I just think we're at the time of an eruption, right? And we're not ready for the eruption. And that's what scares me as a neuroanatomist. It scares me for the volume. And, you know, as soon as the FDA says go, and it pretty much already has, and in other parts of the world, it's already happening, and organizations are training whole tribes of counselors to bring in the volumes of people. This terrifies me. This terrifies me from the perspective of the brain. Will it have, can it have some benefit for some individuals? Yes. Are some people at high risk? Yes. We don't know really who is going to be okay and who is not. That is a reality. I'm concerned also about, you know, not just at the level of the psychedelics, which is to me up here as a heavy, heavy duty meds, but even cannabis right now, there is a new epidemic of people with from from uh, using cannabis who have turned on their hallucinogenic circuitry and are now being diagnosed with schizophrenia. This is reality. And who's talking about this besides my neighbor, who's a doctor, who my little neighbor boy, who who has I've known for 15 years, is now diagnosed with schizophrenia related to his cannabis use in college. And it's like. It's like, I care. I just, I just thank you. I'm just so grateful that you're open to even having the conversation of the cautionary voice at the level of the brain cells. Not that, that it isn't working some miracles on some people, but it is so not for everyone. And that's, that's not the message we're getting right now. We're getting, oh, everybody needs to do it a lot. And I mean, to your point, I'm also very concerned about you know, corporate America moving in to set up an assembly line of treatment facilities, as right. you pointed out, where you buy a set number of package, a uh, set number of sessions, let's say, in a package, whereas it's such an individual experience. If you right. turn it into an assembly line, you're right. going to mess with people because you're not going to give the amount of time that right. it requires just for preparation if you have to charge by the hour, right. uh, let alone the integration afterward, which goes on right. for years if you're right. doing this in a right. responsible right. way. So right. the right. the monetary model is potentially quite dangerous to apply. And it's in already sphere. happening. Yeah. Oh, Australia is already set and ready. I mean, literally, the world is the stage waiting for the FDA to say it's fine. And all I can say is, you know, regardless of what the FDA says, the world will explode once with the monetary model, once they say go. And it's it's it just terrifies me what, what could potentially happen to people's brains. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, I've experienced the issue with unhealthy boundaries. It also seems to attract certain types of personalities as well. It is, I've, in my experience, there are people who are attracted to psychedelics who may not have social community, social support and connection, mm -hmm. and they're, they may not have healthy boundaries. Now you add this all together with a group of people taking psychedelics without necessarily healthy boundaries right. and a support community. I've mm -hmm. seen the fallout from this, especially like Polly was talking about this, the difference with the induced labor. I mean, that's why to me, 5-MeO seems a bit scary because it's so, f so fast so powerful that people seem listen to people who have used this and are proselytizing and trying to pressure people, telling them it will cure X, Y, and Z, where there's 
no preparation. And I've met people who have had very, very painful experiences that they have not recovered from, from using that drug based on a group of people selling, quote, selling them this notion, it's, it's going to cure you in 10 minutes. You know, this one experience is going to change you forever. Without that integration and without an understanding and preparation, it isn't, you know, here's, here's a strange, I'll make a very strange statement. Psychedelics have absolutely no effect, right? Unlike an aspirin, if we give everybody aspirin and we know what the response is with a psychedelic, you're going to have the same dose, the same psychedelic on a different day with the same person in the same setting, have two entirely different experiences. It is a tool. It can be a microscope, as Stan Groff said, or a telescope for consciousness. But as you're pointing out, there are also potential liabilities if this isn't done with people who understand the risks they're taking, what the potential fallout is. And there's no shortcut. And I think in a culture that wants easy shortcuts, that is a potential danger sign because it's being promoted as a shortcut to healing. Whereas in my experience, it requires an enormous amount of effort and work and diligence and patience to integrate these experiences. And while some people I've met have had life altering experiences with one experience, I've noticed that those particular people have worked with therapists who had been doing this underground have 40 or 50 years experience and they take years to integrate each session. They don't just go from session to session. So telling somebody you need to buy six or eight sessions is an absurd way to even discuss this kind of experience. I wanted to bring online this one question about that though, because again, in the group, you know, here I am in Vermont and I've been working as a therapist here for a very long time. The ayahuasca thing, people go to Mexico and they do ayahuasca and ayahuasca seems to be a repeat type of thing. Again, I've never done it. And so I really do hesitate to speak about things that I've never experienced, even though I've witnessed people. And I do feel that the person seeking the ayahuasca experience typically is trying to seek to break through something that they're not able to break through in their ordinary walking around life. And sometimes, you know, it's even something that we've been working on in therapy. They haven't been able to kind of break through it. So they want to do ayahuasca and then they can get drafted into an ayahuasca community also, which usually isn't corporate America. It's something else. I'm not sure what it is, but well, let me just say it like this. You know, as a Buddhist practitioner, I realize that we all live simultaneously in all of these registers. We do live in the register of the formless self or the integrated interdependent, you know, all together and all at once. We also live in a register of sort of idiosyncratic fantasies, hallucinations, uh, desires, actions. We, we're in a dream state, rapid eye movement, sleep every night that looks just like a psychotic kind of state. And that's an ongoing register that we're in. And then we're in this conventional register that we have to, in many ways, struggle to remember each day and to reconstitute as, you know, as Jill tells so well in her books, you know, just to reconstitute, like, who is Polly and what was going on? And, you know, I have many days, like I wake up and I'm, I can't, I can't easily reconstitute what I think happened yesterday. So all three of these registers are going on all the time. These different kinds of chemical environments that people put themselves in, put themselves into a register that is not going to be easily integrated by this left hemisphere, this conventional mind or whatever. I myself don't know why people go for repeated experiences. I do know how people come onto the silver bullet idea because psychiatric medications were supposed to cure depression, cure anxiety. And of course, I knew from the beginning that that was really a lie. I did know the research there and I knew how many groups they had dropped out, et cetera. Americans tend to love silver bullets and they like that idea. But then you've also got the ayahuasca people who are not typically, at least the people from Vermont here, they go to Mexico or someplace like Mexico. It's not a group of corporate people. So, you know, there, there must be something inherently in this desire to uh, integrate, let's say, this register of going beyond the conventional mind and then, you know, repeating it and doing it again and again. I, I don't know. I really don't know exactly what I'm asking, but I just uh, would like to hear your comments because I don't think it's just a corporate push to do that, to, to do the package. You know, it seems to have something to do with the desire to to be in this state of mind. Well, in the in the case of ayahuasca, people make journeys to the Amazon, to Peru, et cetera, Chile, 
to sit with indigenous shamans. The challenge there is how do you know who's a true indigenous shaman and who's a charlatan? And this is this is an issue in the psychedelic community because there are people in the same way we've had conversations about certain Zen leaders getting into trouble. The same thing happens in these circles. There's also, I think, a certain type of indigenous wisdom that people are idealizing. And there's also shared communal space when you, the distinction with an ayahuasca journey is everybody's taking the substance together in the same room and going through the experience together. And then in theory, depending on who you're working with, you're integrating this experience together. So it does create a bond that I think may entice people to continue joining that same circle. Now, there are also circles in every major city in the United States, from New York to LA, where every weekend, they're in New York at least, there are 10 or 20 ayahuasca circles. And there are people bringing indigenous shamans to the US to do this here, especially on native land where they're not subject to federal law. So it's technically not illegal. And yet these same, they're, they're the same pitfalls. It, it, it comes down to how do you know who's qualified? How do you know who is experienced enough as a guide who's going to be able to respond to whatever arises when you have all these different nervous systems that are opening wide at the same time in the same space? I think it, it leads to a great deal of potential for things to go wrong and, you know, for people to get hurt in this experience. Uh, I resonate well with with all of that. And, you know, what I've been hearing most about these days is ketamine. And ketamine is like the drug of abuse for the rich and famous. And it blows my mind what, I mean, I used to use ketamine as an anesthesia uh, for, for surgeries, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. Um, yet in that altered state, there seems to be, you know, new awareness, new brilliance, new possibilities, new openness. And then, um, you know, we're rich enough to hire a chemist to give us a good, you know, saline solution and who knows what. Um, some people are actually having their, their blood dialysis back into themselves after these enormous trips. I know it's mind blowing, literally. I mean, and, and so it's like, so there's something in the nature of the human. And, and the biggest problem with this is, is then this becomes the routine of the week. You know, we begin the drugs on Thursday. By Sunday, we're flushing ourselves uh, with saline and uh, dialysine, clean blood. And maybe by Tuesday, we might almost be ready to look at another human being. And uh, by Wednesday, we're a nice person. And then by Thursday, we're doing it again. I mean, this literally is what is happening. And I, I can't comprehend this other than, you know, then there's never a satisfaction at normal reality because normal reality is now so dull. Who on earth would do it? But I can bring back my genius from my experience, apply it business-wise, uh, set up a new idea, a new product, a new possibility, and then go back to my state of genius while some, some sucker who isn't high uh, slugs through normal reality of life and makes us a lot of money. I mean, this is the condition of our world. As one person who has one voice just trying to help bring in these need to be thought about it's not just go and do this there's there's reasons to to consider the possibility of this might not be a good idea for you for all these reasons that you can find easily on the the um, internet under the research under inclusionary and exclusionary ideas talk to people who have done it a lot of people i know who have because i don't know it was the kind of the drug of choice during my high school years most people didn't get what they thought they were going to get. And so it was uncomfortable. And even under that condition, so, you know, you get an aspirin, you take an aspirin, it thins your blood, you feel differently. <laughs> it's These are serious. These are serious molecules in a very complex structure of a brain. It will result in the traumatic response, natural response of the brain. So it is creating a certain level of trauma biologically. Some people don't get the message to for that circuitry to turn off and then there goes a light and you, you don't know who that person is going to be. So I, I'm just grateful for the conversation, for the diversity of the conversation with you two. Well, I'm grateful that you were bringing this up because I don't think that anyone else that I've talked to has had the clarity and the passion. And actually, one reason we're doing the podcast overall is to try to find something that would be the truth in the mix of all of this, because both Mike and I know from many, many experiences, and I know this from the Zen path as well, waking up is not enough. <laughs> That's really the title of the podcast. And 
And for me, you know, years ago when I was practicing with Shenzhen Young, who was one of my teachers, and a 9-11 thing happened and we saw Osama bin Laden walking around on videos again and again, him walking through caves and teaching. And Shenzhen said, this dude has awakened. You can see it in the way he moves and the way he talks. But he was awakening to being Osama bin Laden, which means that you should kill the infidels. I mean, he wasn't, he was awakening to where he was developmentally. He wasn't awakening to the vast, you know, interconnection. He was awakening to where he is. We all awaken where we are. We don't awaken to somebody else's personality. And so here's Osama bin Laden probably did do some practices, but it awakened him to the desire to kill a bunch of people, I guess. I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but that seemed to be what was happening. And that that really woke me up. When I, when I heard that, I was like, wow, yes, awakening in itself is not the thing. That's not the thing. The thing is that, you know, you're looking for something that can move you out of your grasping anxiety and allow you to become who you are in the framework of helping or doing things. I mean, this is the way I would look at it in any case, is that the whole reason to awaken is to find a better way to help others to get with the program here and figure out what your contribution or gift will be to help others, you know, give back your gift. And instead, uh, you know, you, you awaken at the level you are developmentally also, and you can be awakening and then deciding to rob a bank because you, like you said, you feel you need some more ketamine or something. You know, I mean, I hadn't actually heard any of the the thing that you described, Jill, I never have heard that. And I have several people that have done ketamine as a result of feeling their psychotherapy wasn't fast enough. Mostly, I I it, I, I don't see it making that much difference, except uh, I do worry a little bit about repeated use just because I can't imagine it's not problematic at some brain health level. I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're willing to bring all this up. And I know we're moving here to close our conversation and I want to hear from Mike and then uh, we'll, we'll do well, our- Well, thought, the you. thought that popped into my head may open up a can of worms, but I don't know if you're familiar with Gould Dolan's research, which was published in Nature last year in May, I believe. She had studied all of the different psychedelics, MDMA, ketamine, psilocybin, LSD, and Ibogaine. And what she found is that each of them opens the critical period in the brain and that the opening in that critical window is directly proportional to the length of the psychoactive of the of the trip and that she's even hypothesized and this is just a side note theoretically that the subjective experience of tripping is what it feels like to have your critical windows open so one of the ways she's looking to apply this now for example in an area you may be familiar with is to use psychedelics to open up the critical window for stroke for people who've had stroke to be able to relearn motor and other skills that may have been harmed during the stroke also it's theoretically possible that we will be able to use a psychedelic to open up the critical window for learning a new language because when we're young and we're learning a language we can learn any language and then when that critical window closes it gets more difficult as an as, and as an adult for many to learn other languages but if you could reopen those critical windows we may be able to do that so i think there's there's the potential here again for this blessing and a curse opening critical windows without knowing what you're doing. And this is what happens during the integration period. So, you know, ketamine, very short acting. So it opens up that critical window for a shorter period, which also may relate to what you're seeing, Polly, that maybe there isn't a lot of long-term change and people keep going back to it. Whereas, I don't know if you're familiar with Ibogaine, which is derived from an African tree root and the Bwiti people in Africa have been using uh, iboga. It is the most powerful, longest lasting hallucinogen. The journey is over 24 hours in most cases. But the unique property of ibogaine or iboga is if you give it to opioid addicts, they do not go through physical withdrawal. And one journey in a therapeutic setting where it's legal in Canada and Mexico and not in the United States, so there's a history now of using it in the West, but it appears that one journey has an over 70% success rate in not using opioids. If you give the remaining 24% of the people another journey, it goes up into the 90s. And this is not widely discussed, but again, it really opens up those critical windows for an extremely long period of time. So the integration practice afterwards has to be 
very adeptly handled in order for people to be able to not go back to those addictions. I didn't know if you're familiar with her work because it seems to connect yeah. with some of what you are looking at. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with that, but I, you know, I love the brain. I love the brain. I love researchers who, who study all this stuff. You know, we know that uh, where addictions are in the brain, there are various ways of essentially whacking those cells offline. Essentially, I mean, it, it's all going to go back to the cells. Essentially, you're whacking cells offline, turning them off. And then if you know, you, you have to ask yourself, if I'm opening a, a window into a different part of my brain that now is not addicted to my opioids, right? All of a sudden, these cells are releasing the stimulation or the action of those cells that are addicted. This, this, this moves right straight into my concern about psychedelics is that, that these kinds of changes, now this may, this may be a positive change that someone has studied and identified, but what are the negative impacts that are also happening that we don't even have the language to understand. I mean, I'm convinced that the only reason that my stroke of insight, the book was on the New York Times bestseller list for like 63 weeks was because it gave a different language, a different perception of the brain and a languaging of the way the brain functions in different ways that went offline and then came back online. And it gave people a new level of communication. And as we look at research then as a neuroanatomist, a cellular neuroanatomist, I'm looking at which groups of cells then open these up, stimulate these, which are usually being inhibited, right? Now, all of a sudden you take a drug, you have this, these cells stimulated, and somehow these cells are inhibiting the cells of an opioid addiction. To me, that's fascinating. And that is the, the complexity of the human brain and why I think under any circumstance, people really ought to seriously consider what they're doing before they do it. That seems about the one of the wisest things any of us could ever say is that, yes, before you do something, whatever it is, you should seriously consider what you are doing. And of course, you know, if you drop into one of these states because of your experience or you cultivate one of the states, even doing deep meditation, I think you should seriously consider that it's it's a sacrifice and you know, you're going to be doing something that you wouldn't normally be doing. It's an extreme sport. But I do think that at least in the deep meditative states, whatever's happening with the brain cells is being guided by people that have gone on this, this journey, so to speak, you know, over a long period of time. And there is an aspect of the natural brain just happening and unfolding. The the kinds of things that we're talking about, and I'm I'm so happy that we had this conversation and I, I know we need to wrap it up now, but uh, th these are things that I think have a deep ethical concern connected to them. And that the ethics of even using, you know, I mean, one of my problems with psychiatric medications is that people believed in the decade of the brain in the 90s that we were gonna get rid of depression and anxiety. And I knew from the beginning that it was a lie, that the, the actual research that these kinds of ideas were based on was showing that it was a lie, but we weren't given, we weren't sort of given in an open way access to that research. So here we are again with the idea that something like a pill or a drug or a substance is going to do these things that we find very difficult to do in regular life. And so, you know, I wish we could get to a point where there was a kind of ethical code for scientific practice that held across the board. Like as a psychologist, I have an ethical code and you can measure whether I'm doing it or not by looking at the code and seeing what I've done. And then you could make a complaint if I seem to be promising something that I'm not actually doing. And I, I, I wish that that were true for scientific practices that then become a part of our technology in pharmaceuticals and so on. If we had an ethical code that, that we were aware of across the board, then we could look at, is this an ethical practice to offer these kinds of substances to people? And we could begin to evaluate it. But I, I do think that you that Jill, you've raised the questions so precisely. And, and I'm so grateful to you because I haven't had a conversation like this ever with, with anyone. Uh, and and so it's it's wonderful to have it with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and and I don't get to have it often with people who actually 
uh, have influence in the minds of others who respect them and honor uh, their position. So thank you, both of you. Uh, Mike, it's very nice to meet you. And uh, Paul, my pleasure. Thank you. you. Again. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I, you know, I, it's, I just appreciate being a part of the conversation. Well, thank you so much. And I am sure we will see you again. Thank you and be well. And thanks, Mike. And yeah. uh, it was, it, it's just, it was wonderful and extraordinary. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jill. It's really been a pleasure meeting you and, and hearing your ideas. I, I think this is actually incredibly timely right now and important to get out there. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Enjoyed this episode of Waking Up Is Not Enough, Flourishing in the Human Space? Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and tap the notification bell so you never miss an episode of insightful discussions and explorations into the human psyche. Share this episode with friends and family to spread the journey of self-awareness and critical thinking. Together, let's challenge the norms, embrace empathy, and flourish in our unique paths. Your support means the world to us and our growing community. Share your comments in the thoughts below. We love hearing from you. Please take a moment right now to go to realdialogue.com and join our membership community. For a short time, we're offering annual and lifetime membership in the Real Dialogue community at a very limited cost. There you have access to countless hours of teachings, interviews, conversations with Polly, Mike, and prominent scientists, sages, and seekers who share your interests in waking up and flourishing. Again, go to realdialogue.com, join in a live conversation with Polly and Mike through your membership. The second Tuesday of each month, we have an AMA that we do together. As always, we really look forward to meeting you and to hearing your perspective. Please like and share the podcast with friends and family. If you know of people who you think would benefit from this conversation and would like to take part in our monthly AMAs, consider sharing this with family and friends and consider giving them the gift of membership in our community. This podcast was produced and 